Come, Father God, with the word of God this morning. I pray that he decreases and you increase, oh God. I pray that you just would have your way in these services, Father God, and help us to continue to give you all the praise, the glory, and all the honor, for you alone are worthy from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. We just ask it all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Blessed Holy Ghost for your great name's sake in Jesus' name. Amen. Or the name yes, which Lord. may shall be saved. Amen. 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 We are going, we're um, grateful for these uh, Bible studies, and we just praise the Lord this morning. Um, as the psalmist says, let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord, you know, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the sand. God is worthy to be praised. Sister Janelle is going to open up um, with our worship and praise, and I'm going to pass it on to her, and then we're excited about the word this morning. Brother uh, Pastor Ron is going to come with the word this morning. So without further ado, Sister Janelle, um, can you open up and bless us? The Holy Spirit comes forward. Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Oh, how amazing is your name. I will praise you all my days. Love each other is what you say. Give God the glory and live today. Oh, how amazing is your name. You know. I will praise you all my days. Love each other is what you say. Give God the glory and live today. Oh, how amazing is your name. I will praise you all my days. Love each other is what you say. Give God the glory and live today. Oh, how amazing is your name. I will praise you. All my days, love each other is what you say. Give God the glory and live today. Give God the glory and live today. Give God the glory and live today. Live today. Mm, amen. 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 Uh, Sister gonna sing another song. This song about well, like like Minister Cal always say, is some songs that we kick we kick the sin off the song and make it our own. So this next song, I know um Sister Jackie loves it, and we kind of took a song, worldly song, and kicked the sin off it, as brother uh brother Cal so eloquently puts it. So this song may sound familiar, but we just turned it for Christ. Okay, sister. Amen. Lord, I can't forget. All the things you've done for me, how you took this old wretch and set me free. After all the love changes, my heart belongs to you. When I look back on my life i knew it was you lord you gave me grace and peace when i didn't know where to turn oh and my life is now complete because it's you that lives in my soul you're bringing me joy 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 lord you bring me joy you're bringing me joy 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 lord you bring me joy lord i can't forget all the things you've done for me how you took this old wretch and set me free after all the love changes my heart belongs to you when i look back on my life 
I knew it was you. Hey, Lord, you gave me grace and peace when I didn't know where to turn. Oh, and my life is now complete because you live deep within my soul. You're bringing me joy, joy, joy. Lord, you bring me joy. You're bringing me joy, joy, joy. Lord, you bring me joy. Amen. Wow. Wow. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. These songs that we do, uh, they're yeah. original. We don't, you know, we write them ourselves. So that's one thing about this ministry. Mm. The things that we do in this ministry is going to be original. You'll never hear them nowhere else. Mm. Um, Minister Ron, it's all yours. Wow. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, those songs just bless me every time I hear them. I caught myself humming that song, doing the dishes uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Amen. I'm like, okay, this is how old grandma, you know, used to do it, right? Cleaning and singing and having a word of the Lord in your ears. Beautiful songs, guys. Really, really enjoy them uh, every time I hear them. Thank God for that. Um, amen. So without further ado, guys, we'll, we'll kind of get into, like we mentioned earlier, we, uh, I, I'm not going to lie, I look forward to these corporate studies. At first, I, I, I'm not going to uh, uh, change what I said. I said, I don't know about this. It's a little too much. I don't know. you know. And I was a little apprehensive because I really didn't know how things were going to work out. But like I mentioned to the good sister Jackie before everybody got on, sometimes you just got to let the spirit lead you. And, and so that's what we did here. And wow, so thankful we did that. Um, so anyway, um, the topic of today's study, uh, I know we, we've seen this uh, hook before in a lot of music, um, the things we do for love. And before I get into the, today's um, study, I did want to make a couple of quick points uh, about this statement uh, of the things we do for love. And I think the most important Thing that I really wanted to um, to bring to the forefront was one of the more um, I would say probably one of the, right up there at the top one of the most misunderstood uh, things about this particular attribute of God is God's love and one of the probably more uh, statements that a lot of us have heard even in you know secular circles or passive circles. Uh, it, it never fails. Um, you'll always hear something along the line of people saying, man, if God really loved us, if God is a God of love, how in the world would he have let those planes go into the World Trade Center? Or how in the world would he have let uh, this horrific act happen out in Vegas? Or how in the world uh, could he have allowed uh, for those people over in uh, Israel uh, to be attacked and assaulted the way they were, you know. And so a lot of times uh, when it comes to God's love, it's probably one of the most really, I, and, and, and I think the biggest issue that I have, and I'm going to say this in love, is that we as believers have to, and we say this a lot, we have to have, uh, uh, yes, an answer uh, for, for, for when people will question us. And most people, when there's some form of calamity, the first place they come to are people that they know in their minds, they either go to church, or, and we say that a lot, you can't go to church, but people that fellowship in churches and different things, and they come to us with a lot of these questions. And they're loaded questions in most cases. And one of the things that we say in this ministry, and, and we do say a lot, we don't try to sound so theological and so uh, 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 knowledgeable that we, you know, we're above all things and we're so intellectual. Um, but make no mistake, we still should have a very uh, solid uh, logistical answer to a lot of the things that God does. And even though we like to use the cliche that God works in very mysterious ways, we also have to be honest and say that God also works in very obvious ways. There are a lot of things that God does in our lives that are not so mysterious as we like to paint that mysterious picture. 
A lot of these things are extremely obvious, meaning that if I do this or if I do that, most likely these are going to be the results. So what I'm trying to say in so many words is that we as believers, we have to give people a very solid answer beyond the God did it because that's what God wanted to do or God told me because that's what God said so. And while those answers are very good for me because I'm not gonna question what God does, but in the mind of the unbeliever, sometimes we just have to give them a little bit more than just because God said so. So without further ado, let's dive into today's material. Um, I, I, I think this will be good for all of us to take our time and really look at this. So when we ask the question about love, let's start with Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five. Now, no one has to turn there. I think uh, this is pretty much on the screen. Um, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your soul and all your might. And so why are we reading that? Well, I think the first thing we want to talk about today is, and you know, the beautiful song, The Power of Love, right? But we want to talk about the right love and what exactly is the type of love that God is actually talking about in this context. We, we heard this before. Uh, we recognize this, this same scripture um, in the New Testament with the rich young ruler and um, Jesus is, is, is challenging him. And uh, he's telling, uh, he, Jesus said, well, first of all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And he's like, oh yeah, all these things. And so this is a very, very important way to start the narrative is when we talk about love, do we, meaning we as believers, really understand the type of love that God is referring to in this scripture? Do we really understand how we should love, the way we should love, the way God wants to be loved, right? A lot of us have been in relationships, most of us at one time or another, and we know that it's very important to get to know the person who we love and how they want to be loved and the way they want to be loved, because it doesn't matter if you think you're loving someone and it's not the way they want it, the way they want to be loved. So it's almost like mute point. But not to get too much into that, let's look at the uh, the scripture and, and, and understand it from the, uh, the Hebrew. And the only reason why we do this, again, is because of the uh, meaning of the word in the Hebrew. And one of the main reasons, and I know we talk about the Hebrew and the Greek and the Greek and the Hebrew. And again, we don't want to sound like we're so far, uh, you know, R.C. Sproul or whatever, theological. But the real reason behind this is because the Old Testament or the Tanakh, as it said, was actually written in Hebrew. And so sometimes due to some of the, how can I say this? There are a lot of Hebrew words that sometimes don't translate into the modern era or to the modern language. There are certain phrases that are used in Hebrew that have a totally different meaning. So a lot of times we will go back and look at the Hebrew just because, like we said, the Old Testament, the Tanakh was written in uh, Hebrew. But again, the, the two words that come to mind, and Bishop and I were talking about this earlier in the week, uh, the Ahab or the Ahava, which actually is derived from the Ahab. But the bottom line is the meaning to love, to have affection for, right? With all of your heart. I love that. With all of your heart, right? This is to carry a deeper meaning, meaning that to love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul is not just an emotional thing alone. It's not just the emotions, right? It's the entire being, right? Your entire essence, everything you have is in this love, right? Your intellect, your desires, your will, right? How many times have we talked about the, the, the mind not agreeing with the heart and the heart, you know, my mind is it telling me this and my heart is telling me that, and, you know? So God is wants, the, he wants the everything, right? And I love this word because again, it symbolizes a complete total devotion. Now a question was presented to me earlier in the week when it comes to a committed love to the Lord, your God. So the question for today's study, which we'll see as we go through the scriptures, 
can you really love someone with all your heart, with all your might, with all your soul and not be committed, not be loyal? Can you separate the loyalty aspect of love outside of the commitment? And so, and outside of love in general, I think we're going to find out as we go through the scriptures today that I don't think that's possible. Now, we have seen things in our lifetimes and our experiences that have come into play that challenges this very thing. Matter of fact, we could be right now living in an experience that challenges this. You know, I remember uh, someone asked me a question, would you rather have me, uh, and I might be my wife, I hope she don't kick me for this, but would you rather me be committed to you as your wife, right? Or just love you? And I know what we're talking about. We were talking about intimacy and things like that. Because early on, I don't know, I'm the only one on this call that's gone through that. The first five, seven years of a marriage, we have men on this call who are hot like hot tamales. And, you know, you women, you know, being realistic, you know, you're not always there. <laughs> you know, you're not always ready to, uh, you know, excuse the uh, PG version, swing from the chandeliers, as we say, right? And so, you know, my wife challenged me and she said, you know, do you want commitment? Is that not important to you? And, um, you know, I remember sitting on, on, on the side, you know, in my bed thinking about that, really thinking about that. And uh, obviously, uh, 20 some odd years later, there, that reality is, yeah, of course you want commitment. You know, of course you want somebody that's ride or die. So without further ado, um, and we'll get back to this question. Uh, before we close out. But I want to jump into the scriptures for the sake of time. Uh, Brother Mike, um, when you can, um, I'll get to you queued up in a second. But when a man looks for love, he or she, he or she, because this is men, mankind, must absolutely be sure of a couple of things. The first thing we must be sure is that God's love remains the primary of all things, Right? God's love remains the primary of all things. In inconsistency, when God says in the commandment, you must love the Lord thy God, right? I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Again, that is very significant in what we're saying right now. Because in order to put something before God, that means you have to have a love for something that's stronger, than the love of God the Father. And so, again, like we know, we don't wanna be looking for love in all the wrong places as, as many of us, myself mostly included, have done throughout my lifetime. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about uh, female male relationships. Some of us look for love in the wrong places when it comes to finances. Some of us look to love in the wrong places when it comes to the things that we have, our possessions, where we live, what we own, the type of friends we have, right? A lot of us look for love in the wrong places. We're looking for certain statuses. Some of us drown ourselves in even our businesses. We gotta be careful that we don't put these things, right? These love of these things, we have to constantly keep them in perspective. And the bottom line is to reduce the danger and the risks that come from these misguided loves. So without further ado, uh, Brother Mike, if you don't mind, Genesis 3, 6, 12. Let's get some scripture content on this of uh, what our first introduction to misguided love uh, has a tendency to look like. I'm sorry, Bishop, you had your hand up. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know we talked about this. Um, most of this stuff is by design. But when it says that when you talk to, about God, it, it's not that God loves. The Bible said God is love. He is the full definition. He embodies it. He's, he is love. We love. Like, we're sinners, and we try to love, right? That never, ref when, it, when it speaks about God, that God loves us, it's just not that he loves. He is love. He's everything love is. He's the full definition of it. So I think, you know, we we missed that a little bit. Now, sin is love. We we try to love, you know, we have a sin nature, so it makes it very difficult for us to love. Ron says something powerful. When we looked up those words, 
there was a there was a lot of applications. Um, and when it's used for man, as far as the companion, one one of the things that jumped out at me when me and Ron was looking at those words, the word that we was looking at, and because there's about nine different words for love in Hebrew, we just use love. They got nine separate words for love. And the word they used in that text that Ron used was uh, like a friendship, like the way you love a friend, right? And I was like taken back by it because, you know, God wants us to love him like we love a friend, like, because we love our friends. Let's be real. Like, we got best friends. We love them unconditionally. Some of my friends has done everything you can, I can just bring up a a pothorage of stuff that my friends have done that I have let go because I love them and still remain loyal to the friendship. You know, I'm sure everybody on this phone can, can, can relate. So I was blown away by it because in the New Testament, we always say the Old Testament is the New Testament revealed. So in the New Testament, Jesus says that, um, you know, he gives that definition. Like he says, I no longer call you servants, but friends. Like God wants us. Like that's the only, you know, you look at any other belief system, Mohammedism, Buddhism, Hinduism, their God doesn't relate to them like that. Their God is like, you know, this God they're so afraid of. And if they don't do all these religious, religious, religious works, their God will just crush them. You know, the, the way they look at their gods, it's, it's not a friendship. It's not that level of intimacy where God wants to be your friend. Our God, the God who created the cosmos, the heaven and earth, the galaxies, everything wants to be your friend. That blows me away. That, that overwhelms me. Jesus, I call you my friend. God wants to be, he wants us to look at him and love him. Like he wants that level of intimacy, not like I'm your God and I'll just destroy you if you don't do what I say. Hey, but he wants to be your friend. That alone is something to be like, wow, why would, you know, I'm a, you know, sinful man. The Bible said he called David his friend, you know, and that friendship love, that friendship love is, is sacred, but it's up, it's down. You know, I always use this text when Moses got so mad, he yelled, he says, these my kids, I ain't give birth to them. He yelled, he was talking to God, like you would talk to your friend. And God said, calm down, Moses. Okay. Like you would talk, that level of intimacy, God. But we don't let him in. A lot of us don't let God in that space. We'll have our friends, you know, our regular worldly, you know, our, you know, human friends. But we don't let God in that space. We can't phantom God being our friend and treating God like, you know. I always say, you know, especially to my kids or to my friends, I said, tell God how you feel. Don't think he's that distant and that far away. Be like, I'm mad. I don't like this. I'm upset. Speak to him. Because that's the intimacy he wants to have with everybody on his phone. That friendship, you know? And another word that jumped out at us when we was looking at this text, like Ron already said it so eloquently, loyalty. There's no love apart from loyalty. Like, we say we love God. Like, it's all lip service. But we're not loyal to God at all. We don't give him our loyalty. We give him our, our lip service love. Yeah, I love the Lord, but we don't serve him. We don't fellowship with him. We put him on a back burner. He's at the end of everything. We get back to him, you know? And then we wonder why, we, you know, we're not growing. We're not effective. We're not learning. We're stagnant. See, we can't love God and not be loyal to God. And I don't mean loyal in the sense how the world looks at it, but loyal to the committed to, to, to the ministry, committed to furthering the gospel, committed to people knowing the Lord, because he know we're imperfect, but committed in our hearts to everything, you know, watching, letting God use us and talking to him every day, making sure our kids, our friends around us know that we love God and we're friends with God and wanting them to be friends too, teaching our children how to develop their friendship their intimacy with their God, we're not, you know, we're not loyal to that at all. So these are things that when God, you know, when he says these things and he challenges man, these are things he tries to correct us because we go on with this, you know, 
thing in our head that we love God so much, but there's no loyalty, no way in sight when it comes to God. That's all I want to say. Amen. Amen. Mm. Appreciate that. Um, amen. Brother Mike, if you don't mind, please read Genesis 3, 6, 12. Amen. Um, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Verse 7 says, then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Verse 8 says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? Verse 10 said, he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Amen. Amen. A couple of key things. And just to kind of really go uh, back a little bit of what, what Bishop was saying. I mean, let, let's let's keep it real. You said something that jumped off the page there that God just wants us to, to talk to him, man. He wants that relationship. And when I hear in verse nine and God is calling the man, where are you? Like, how many times does he ask us, where are we? <laughs> Meaning that you might be here, but where's your mind, right? Where's your head? Where's your heart, right? So I thought that was very powerful. Another thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take some, some weight a little bit off, off of Adam. I, I can't even imagine what the Garden of Eden really looked like, like really, really looked like. I mean, we try to come up with these de depictions of it and you know, we come up with all these different ideologies of what we think it may have looked like, and you see it all in movies, but we have no idea. When you're talking about the power of a God who has the power to create at just, you know, with just the word, we can't even imagine. And I hope I don't offend any of the women that's on this, this call Sunday, but I can't even imagine what Eve looked like, like, right, like, really, like you're talking about a woman before sin came into the world, flawless, you know, not even the greatest model on the planet of the earth right now could probably look like this woman. Though. So let's just get that out of the way, right? Adam was dealing with a lot, okay? Beautiful place, everything you can possibly want and more. The most beautifulest woman literally on the planet or where in the garden. And so with that being said, we honestly understand that in this scenario, you know, the man loved the created, his love for the created superseded his love for the creator. And so we see our very first introduction in way, way back in Genesis about how we are not to have a loving relationship with our God. This is a very early example and I'm glad it's there early because technically it really sets everything in motion because we obviously know that Adam's choice in love ultimately opened up the floodgates of hell. So again, it's not just so much, you know, that his decision was a poor decision, but the reality of that decision and the things that his decision did and his choice in love, you know, we're all feeling those effects to this day. And so that's another thing. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I just want to make sure we understand what it looks like when man makes the wrong choice, when it comes to his God, God of the universe, against all these other things and distractions that in this case was able to move Adam away. Um, Minister Mike, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I love what you're saying, brother. This is a powerful word about love. Um, 
I love the scripture you're using right now. Um, I was touched by it because it's a scripture that I shared a long time ago with someone very dear to me in my life. You know, it's funny how it says in the text that the woman that you put here gave me the fruit to eat, right? That's very interesting. And, you know, Adam says, the woman you gave me gave it to me, right? <laughs> it's funny because women don't realize how much influence they have over a man in some cases. Women have a, have a powerful influence over us, you know? And even back then here and even today, you know, a lot of things that we do as men is for a woman, unfortunately, right? And the powerful thing is understanding when a woman is able to walk in the things of God and to walk in humility and the fruits of the spirit, it, it affects a man profoundly, right? Uh, a woman could be rotten to a man's bones, a woman could also speak life into a man. Women, uh, they have a very, very heavy influence on a, on a man, not to go off subject. But talking about love, if you read this text, that's just a little side note, I just thought that was interesting. Um, but back to love, if you look down in this particular text that you that you got here, um, Ron, which is a powerful text, it says that once God realized everything they did, he said he clothed them, he took some, um, like some um, outfits of clothing and he clothed them with something better than the figs they had. Like they put figs around them, but then after the consequences comes, Jesus Christ clothes them, he covers them. And you know, one thing about God, he always covers us. Even when we make horrible decisions, you know, I made some horrible decisions and decisions that probably could have cost me my life. And God, them consequences, I felt those consequences, but I also felt God covering me and loving me as part of those consequences. The powerful thing about God is that you're gonna you, you're gonna feel every sin you commit. I, every sin I ever committed, I felt it. God made sure he's the Bible says he chastises those who he loved, but I also <laughs> felt him covering me. You know, like the world doesn't do that. Satan doesn't do that. He leaves you out there butt naked on the freeway. But God, thank God that he covers us. You know, they forfeited everything in that moment. And you read down in this text, if you guys take time to read this text, he says, he, he said, you know, this is gonna happen. These are the consequences for both of you guys, but I'm gonna cover y'all now, you know, and that covering he gave them is a foreshadowing of the covering of Jesus Christ that he does for us right now, you know, no one is able to, to cover their own sins, all of us are sick because of sin, we all have the same condition, we all fell short, but we have a God that loves us in spite of us, and in spite of our frailties and our horrible decisions that he covers us, Brother Cal says something powerful, like there's no other God in no other belief system belief system, sorry for that, that covers us the way our God does. And I thank God for him for doing that because, you know, I look at my life and I don't deserve 99% of the things that God has done for me. If I look at how I've conducted myself and how we sin against a holy God. And let's, let's make this clear before I pass it back to you, Minister um, Ron. God doesn't tolerate sin. So don't think, oh, I didn't really do too much. He's holy. He's holy. That means he does not tolerate sin. So the fact that his love to cover us like that, it's mind blowing. It, you can't even fathom God's agape love, right? It's un, undescribable and uncomprehendable to know that someone is going to do something ill to you tomorrow, but you're gonna still love them, protect them, take care of them, keep them in the right mind after knowing what they're gonna to do tomorrow. Amen. Some of us gonna do some horrible acts tomorrow. Some of us going to do some stuff tomorrow that God can't stand, but he's going to still take care of you. He's going to still feed you. He's going to still put you in your right mind. He's going to still make sure he protects you. He's going to still make sure that he holds death from your life. Because Satan wants to kill us. Let's just keep it 100. Let's keep it real here. Satan wants to kill you. Your flesh wants to corrupt you, and the world hates you. And God holds all those things back from taking over us while we sin against him, but yet he still loves us. Come on. I can't, it can't get... I, you can't even fathom a love like that. So why do we depend on and don't depend on that love? For me, it's, it's mind blowing, but I just wanted to make that point that he truly, truly loves us outside of us. Go ahead, brother, I'm sorry. Amen, brother, outstanding point, uh, very powerful point. And uh, right on cue, uh, when we think about what you just said, let's, let's, let's move on. Let's go to the next scripture. When the love was, I believe was properly positioned. Uh, Genesis 22, nine through 12. Let's go ahead and read that. 
All right. Uh, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Verse 10 says, Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called him, called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Amen. Powerful stop right there. I think the powerful thing is we obviously are still in the book of Genesis. So we haven't really gotten that far removed from, uh, you know, what took place in the garden. And I love the way um, you guys are really bringing it full force. And I do want to make a note to this give and take. We are operating now, obviously, in the Old Testament, which means that, you know, in this particular scenario, the, the Holy Spirit was not in us, working and dwelling in us. So that really kind of makes me feel even even worse, right? When we talk about our attitude toward God's love, like we have the Holy Spirit, guys, dwelling in us, you know? And so we really should have a totally different perspective about what's going on with God, uh, unfortunately, than these guys had back back during this time period. Because again, again, like we said, the Holy Spirit was not in place, right? Um, so I just wanted to say this to say that, but my quick point is, is that we all know the backdrop of this story. We've heard this story hundreds of times. And um, before I pass it to you, Bishop, the reality of it is, is that we already know that Adam, excuse me, that Abraham could not bear children. We know that he was dying to have a son. We know the whole story around this child, that Abraham was promised that his, his offspring would be like the sands of the earth and that everything was predicated on the promise that his God had made to him. And we know what happened. He couldn't wait. He lost patience. They, they went out there and his Egyptian, uh, uh, Sarah's Egyptian servant, she had him uh, have a child with that servant. We already know that story. That child ended up becoming Ishmael. And we know that uh, the ramifications of that decision is still being felt to this day in the Middle East. And so we understand all of that. And so how much deep love and something that um, Minister Cal said earlier when he talked about friend, very few people, but Abraham was called a friend of God. And so when I think about what you said earlier, uh, Minister Cal, and then putting that in perspective, that Abraham was called God's friend, even to the point where we already know what this whole scene looks like right here. This Here's a scene that is worth not a thousand pictures, but millions of pictures. Abraham is now laying the one uh, piece, the one key ingredient to his offspring, to this promise that God made. And God comes to him and says, listen, you're going to sacrifice your son and take him up on Mount Moriah and, and you're going to do the unthinkable. And let's be realistic. And I, and I know this is striking a chord. And mothers on this call can, I know I'm striking a chord, but don't touch my baby. Don't touch my baby girl, my baby boy. Don't touch my children, right? The mother hen in most people would never consider something like this ever, right? And so the protectiveness of, of the children and how, you know, protective you are and, and, and for God to come, you know, to uh, Abraham and ask him to do this, let's face it, we got some people in the world today will be like, are you out of your mind? There's no way and you know where I'm going to do something like this. I don't care who you are, right? And so let's keep it 100, man. This, this is unbelievable to me. The fact that he considered doing this. Now, a couple of things that this picture represents, two things. One is we already talked about the love that Abraham had for his God. Obviously, it's the type of love that we're, that we're bringing out in this Bible study, that we're trying to express that the type of love that God wants, right? Abraham is showing us this, right? And I love how quickly he does, not long after Adam, but to think what else could be in Abraham's mind? And I think I got the answer to that. I think what's really in his mind right now is that this 
God is a God because we all said it. Any Everything above God's name is his word. If God told me that he was going to bring forth the lineage of thousands and thousands of generations and they would be calling me Father Abraham and we talk about Abraham to this day, then he must have a result if I do this. And so his, not only did he have a love of God, but notice how his faith operated in consistency with his love. I'm going to say that one more time. The faith operated in consistency. A lot of us try to separate these pieces out. Well, I have some faith and then I have some love over here and there's some dedication over there and some loyalty over here. And what we're trying to say on this Sunday is that all th these components work consistently together to bring forth the results that God is looking for. And so he had to have faith to know that God was going to be true to his word, even him doing such a horrific act as this. He didn't ask a whole lot of questions. We all know with us, our flesh, man, well, well, well why? Well, well, you know, we, anybody that's had children and you tell your kids, hey, I need you to do this or do that. What do they ask? They ask you a thousand questions. Why, 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 why? Right? And then we pull the God card because I said so, right? Shut your mouths, right? So my point is, is that, nah, Abraham didn't do that. And so we obviously know what ended up happening the angel of the Lord, as Mike read eloquently, intervene and says, no, right? God says, you have the right heart, the right attitude, the right type of faith. You have everything that I'm looking for in my creators, my creation. You have it. And so he intervenes. And nevertheless, we know where the story goes after this. So again, on the first note, we see what went down in the garden and how Adam struggled and struggled and struggled. And as Minister Mike said, God still loved them past it, right? And then in the second sense, sense, you see where Abraham, under far worse stress and duress, goes through all of this stress and duress. Because remember now, he, he's not Adam. He, he's not in this garden. He doesn't have this supernatural mystique about him. He's just, he's truly a real mortal man. Right. So he knows he can die, he can bleed, he can do all these things. So it was a little bit more complicated for Abraham in his situation because of his physical shortcomings. But at the same time, we see that he was able to make the right decision in this case. Um, Bishop, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I know you had to. Um, I love the fact in Genesis when he read about Adam and Eve, we always highlight this. They didn't kill, you know, Adam and Eve didn't kill nobody. They didn't use drugs. They wasn't running around having sex, fornicating. They didn't commit adultery. All they did was bite a piece of fruit. And creation fell. And sin entered in. And it's been crazy ever since. We try to minimize our sins. Like, well, I don't do that. At least I don't kill nobody. At least I don't steal. At least I don't cheat on my wife or cheat on my husband. At least, you know, I don't do this and I don't do that. We always try to make ourselves feel better. But sin on any level, as small as just biting a piece of fruit, is treason against a holy God. So what do we do, right? And I see that, you know, a lot of Christians miss that. You know, they minimize and they judge other people. We look at other people. Well, you mean, I'm like, like Jesus, at least I'm not like him. I'm not like her. Right? Again, all Adam and Eve did was bite a piece of fruit. I got fruit right now, I'm eating right now. <laughs> What's the big deal? See, sin is whatever God tells us not to do, period. It's treason. R.C. Sproul passed away. I used to love what he used to say, cosmic truth Amen. against all God. And it's worthy of death. So we got to be careful how we minimize the things we do. That's one. Um, also, I love what he said. Mike said, God is holy. I love when he said that. You know, if you look in, I think, Isaiah chapter 6, one of them, it says that the angels 
He saw the angels flying around God, flying around God. And he says, with two, they covered their heads. With two, they covered their body, their wings. With two wings, they covered their face. With two wings, they covered their body. With two wings, they covered their feet, right? And they were completely covered. He said, and all they did was fl fly around saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord thy God. Holy, holy, holy. I mean, that's what they were created to do. You know, we do what we want to do. But these angels were just created to do that. And they do that night and day. And they said God's holiness is the only attribute that's spoken of repetitive to the superior. Nothing else. Not that God is love, love, love. God is mercy, mercy, mercy. But God is holy, holy, holy. And it doesn't stop. See, we got to understand that our God is holy. And everything he does has to be in perfect line with his holiness. God does nothing outside of his holiness. So we look at all the world going on, the catastrophes, like Ron said, and everything going on in the world. We're like, you know, why does God tolerate all of this? And we always say this because he was waiting for you. Since the, when God, like one pastor said, when God, when Adam and Eve um, committed sin and they committed treason, because people always talk about free will. But when Adam and Eve committed treason that day, they said God could have just destroyed them and started fresh. But he said, no, I'm going to wait. I'm going to create a new heaven and I'm in a, a new earth. But I'm going to wait for Ron. I'm going to wait for Janelle. I'm going to wait for Rita. Right? I'm going to wait for the people on his phone. Jeremiah, pray. I'm going to wait for them before I create. And I'm going to allow some people to be in it. They said, once they did that, it was on God. Once they committed that level of treason, it was up to God to do what he wanted to do. They know what he wanted to do? He said, I'm going to take some people out of this one and put them in the next one. I'm going to wait. And I'm going to forgive them. And he set up, you know, even if we skip right now, fast forward to, you know, again, a lot of answers, we say this in the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament back then. We have it. We always say the New Testament is the Old Testament concealed and the Old Testament is the New Testament revealed. So we have the New Testament. We can, you know, we're under a new and better covenant. Like Ron said, Adam chose his wife, but the born again Christian, the authentic people who love God, they're going to choose Christ. The true women of God ain't going to choose that man. She's going to choose Christ. The born under this new and better covenant through the power of the Holy Spirit, they're going to choose Jesus. See, God, he reversed that process in the God where, again, where Adam and Eve chose to do their own thing. Under this, under his son, this new and better covenant, we choose Christ. The real born again believers. Everybody said they Christian. I'm talking about the true believers, as we see it throughout our history, human history, always chose Christ, even to the pain of death over everything. Right? So God did reverse that thing in the God under his son, under this new and better covenant. Also, I want to say this one last thing. When Abraham took his son up there. He didn't know what was going on. That mountain, if you look at it, it's called Mount Moriah. That's the same mountain they slew Jesus on. He said, take your only son up to that mountain. Your only son. He was setting the stage for something. Jerusalem wasn't even there yet. It was nothing built there. It wasn't Israel. It was none of that. It was just a place in the mountain. If you look at the, do the geographic, and they did the homework on that mountain where he took his son, that's the same mountain where they slew Jesus on. Same place. Right? Where God did give his only son. See, God was setting the stage for something way back then. Abraham didn't know. God don't always tell us what he's doing. He's not always, he's not going to explain stuff to us all the time. We just got to trust him. We got to love him. We got to trust, again, that he wants to be our friend, that he wants that level of intimacy. Like when our friends say, look, man, just trust me, man. I got you. God's like, Abraham, don't worry about it. I ain't going to explain all that. Just trust me, man. Because he was God's Amen. friend. Amen. Right? That was Mount Moriah. That's where they slew Jesus. Same place. Where God, where Abraham, he spared Abraham's son. He stopped him because he was setting the stage for something. But on that very mountain, he allowed them to take his son for the sins of the world. He was setting the stage way back then. Way back then. God was setting it up for us to come in to know him and have a relationship with him through his son. Amen? That's all I want to say, bro. Amen. Powerful points. Powerful points. 
So moving right along, let, let's. And I know we, we we probably press for time, guys. I promise I won't hold you much longer. But the second introduction that we have to this misguided love is First Samuel chapter three, uh, eleven through fourteen. Um, and you guys know this story well. The men's study we had just went through this. Uh, the Lord now is communicating uh, to Eli because his sons were serving in the temple, and uh, unfortunately. They weren't doing things the way God wanted them to do it. The, these guys were uh, 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 doing all kind of things like accepting bribes and uh, dealing with the, uh, uh, the the sacred things of God in the wrong manner. Uh, they were dealing with the uh, women in the temple, uh, having sexual relations, just doing all types of things to bring shame uh, to the house of Eli. And uh, we talked about this again, uh, as we saw in the previous setting, uh, when it came down to making the right decisions where it comes to those who we love. And, and we saw the story, obviously, with Abraham, and he didn't put his son, right, before the love that he had for God. He didn't do that. You know, most of us normally uh, can understand that. We've talked about that before. Mother's love, you know, for their children. Don't harm my little hints and things like that. And But Eli did take that similar approach. Um, obviously, um, there were things that he obviously could have done, should have done. And, and for all do, you know, whatever, you know, he didn't do it. You know, whatever was on his mind of not setting those boys straight, um, he didn't do it. And we know that the decision that he made uh, had really catastrophic results. Uh, God ended up completely removing Eli and his lineage completely uh, from the priesthood uh, after this uh, shame that his sons uh, brought to uh, the temple and to the, uh, the, the title that they had uh, of being priests. And so again, we always, and, and I like what uh, uh, you, you both you guys said, we're still dealing with a holy God here and know what God is love, 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 love. And we talk about this a lot. But remember, we open with the question that most people will always ask you, you know, uh, and we see the, uh, the, the passive Christian will ask you and say, how can a God of love allow these horrific things to happen? A lot of times it goes back to a lot of things that people miss, whether it be by design, obviously through Satan or just flat out in uh, uh, Eli's situation, just a horrific decision that he made. But we'll go to um, realizing that Eli is not alone. A lot of people have made these types of decisions. It's just that when you're in a position like Eli, and when you are, let's say in our modern era, when we're believers, people that have given our life to the Lord, we're held to a little bit different standard. Um, Brother Rick, I don't know if you're in a position uh, to read. If you can, please, um, Second Samuel. Brother Rick, are you there? And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing say one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus said the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. Amen. We could stop right there. You know, it's amazing when we think about things. I, and, I, you know, as I was working on this, uh, you know, it, it just jumped off the pages of who we're talking about here. Some of the most powerful 
um, uh, 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 men of the, of the Bible that ever lived. I mean, who, what young man growing up in any type of inner city uh, has never heard of the story of David and Goliath? Most of us, myself included, were bullied and picked on and everything. And, and David was really our first introduction about subduing that big, bad bully. So David has always had a special place in my heart, even before I even was sold out for the gospel. And so when I think about this, uh, again, another tremendous uh, 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 man of the Lord. And when you think about, again, this is before the Holy Spirit now. So we already know the story. David's, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's all over Bathsheba. And very similarly, we've seen this decision happen before in the garden, right? Where the woman took dominance over this man and made him do something that was absolutely horrific. I, there's no other way to put it, you know? And, um, you know, even after I read this story, I just had a hard time digesting it because I had, in my mind, in my young spiritual mind, I had put David on such a pedestal, right? And I just could not imagine that he could do something like this. Again, in my young, immature spiritual mindset, many years ago. But my point is, is that I want to cover something here because one of the things that step out about David is that when David was actually confronted out of most people that I know, he, he I don't know. And I, even what I know, and even what I've seen spiritually, scripturally, I mean, his attitude was always in the right place, man. And so the one thing I love about David's action is he did this horrific thing Bathsheba takes her, husband's killed. But something that he did that not even his own offspring would do. I know we talked about this story years ago, uh, not years ago, uh, months ago. Uh, well, actually we did. But the story about the, uh, the rape uh, that his son did to Tamar, horrific. And one of the biggest things that we highlight in that story, uh, obviously the, the, the act that he did was horrific. But we talk about the worst part of it was that he didn't even take ownership of what he did. And instead of him marrying her and she recalls him and she says this as he gets so angry because she didn't receive the love that he wasn't reciprocated. He, he gets angry with her and kicks her out. And she says to him, don't do this. Don't do this. What you're doing is worse than the act that you just committed. Right. So one thing I love about David, David's actions always seem to line up the right way, like the right actions based on no matter what's going on around him. He's always seems to do the right thing and have the right response. So the first thing he does is he goes out and he immediately marries her and brings her in to the palace to to to, to give her the respect, you know, uh, that he made this decision, you know, regardless of how bad the decision was. He was willing to live with that decision. And I thought that was very powerful. You know, a lot of us today, we know we, some of us have made some terrible decisions. And a lot of times we don't own up, you know, uh, uh, you know, I laugh a little bit. Bishop talks about, uh, Minister Cal talks about, you know, in prison, everybody said, I ain't do it. I'm innocent. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, okay, whatever. Going down there and lock up. Right. So whatever, man, you know what I mean? Like we always try to push off. You know, David didn't do that. Uh, Brother Rick, if you can, 2 Samuel 12, uh, 15 through 24. Read that for us. I promise I won't be much longer. Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of the house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth. But he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we speak unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he vex? How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants were were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead, 
Therefore, David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David rose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me, that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her. And she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him. Mm. I thought this was so powerful, guys. I mean, David just never ceases to amaze me. Here's a man. And you guys said it best, Brother Mike and Brother Cal, that God is a just God. God has to take action for sin. Let's make no mistake. He has to. But what's so powerful about this is knowing that this, this young, this child was going to die. David is praying and praying and fasting and rolling around in sackcloth and doing all these things, right? Nathan rebukes him. He doesn't make any excuses. He goes on, he says, maybe in these seven days, maybe, just maybe, just maybe, just maybe, just maybe God will spare, right? However, we know that God ended up taking David's son, called him home. But here's the most powerful thing, guys, and I'm, I'm, I'm jumping through the, the camera of the Zoom. How many times have we seen people get so pissed off because I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and God didn't. Or I prayed and I prayed and I prayed that my moms wouldn't pass or that my son didn't pass or that this didn't happen and that didn't happen. And, and then when God doesn't answer our prayers, do we take on the behavior and the attitude of David? Do we do that? Of course, most people do not. Instead of falling on their face and accepting what God has done. And Mike said it best. God had the power right there. He could have wiped David out, killed everybody, and went on about his business, and he would have been just in doing so. He could have done that, but he didn't. Again, we talked about this friendship, this love, and in these instances, God stepping down to show us in real, real time what real love looks like, he allowed David to go through all of that. And in the end, David gets up, cleans himself off, anoints himself with oil. He goes to eat. And what's the first thing his, his, his bodyguards? Ah, well, I don't get it. Why is he not? Why is he not? Because he is willing to understand and accept whatever decision a holy God makes. And he's okay with that. See, too many of us are not okay when God makes a decision in certain areas of our life, if he removes that friend or that relationship or that job or whatever it is. We don't know. God is eternal. There's certain things that he's going to remove from our lives. And we cannot have this attitude of anger and resentment toward a holy God who only wants what's best for us in his will. And so what I love about this is David's willingness to accept, not argue, not fight, not fuss, not carry it a certain way. And he, again, amazes me how he's able to respond to a holy God's decision, his judgment, whatever it is. And we've been there, even in our own homes with our own children, how they rebuke, how they fight back against decisions. But again, David showing the proper attitude in this response. Um, Minister Cal, I'm sorry, you had your hand. Yeah, amen, amen, brother. You are, you hammered it home, brother. The nail is in, you still hammering. It's powerful, brother. One thing I want to say is this. Um, one, going back to Eli, because you, you touched on it, but you flew to the next verse. Eli loved his sons more than he loved the Lord. 
See, again, we said it earlier. We could we could declare, we could say we love God again all day long, but Eli's actions proved that he loved his children more because he wouldn't correct them. Mm. When they were out of control and doing what they wanted to do, because they were priests, they were of the lineage of Aaron. That was supposed to be a sacred lineage. And they was doing anything they wanted to do. Eli was supposed to remove them from the priesthood, take them down and replace them, and he would not. He would not correct his children. And these are crimes that we commit against God that, that we we don't even, you know, we we make adjustments to leave them in whatever rebellion they're in, and we don't stand against them. And Eli did not stand against them. And the same day they lost their lives, Eli lost his life, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Go back to David. David, um, what did he do? Again, and again, like Ron said, this is the old covenant. We're under a new and better covenant, praise God. But the point is, David, I love what God told him when he took um, Bathsheba and um, he killed Uriah. Uriah wasn't just anybody. It was one of his best friends. It was, mm. one, it was They were close. David had 30 generals. Uriah was one of them. He loved David, right? He loved, he, he, he adored him. And when he killed him and, and, and took his wife, you know, David already had about eight, nine wives and concubines. And when he killed him, he took his wife, right? Um, God was mad. He came to David. And this scripture blows me away. He said, if you wanted more wives, I would have gave them to you. He said, why you killed your best friend mm. and took his wife? Mm. Why would you do that, David? See, we look at God, very narrow-minded. Certain things we think God cares about, he really doesn't. He understands his creation to the fifth power. There's certain things we do that God just can't stand. It ain't always, the, you know, the action. We always look at the, the action. God looks at the heart's attitude towards the action. God always looks at why we did what we did. And that's how the level of mercy you get from God, it depends on, again, why you did what you did. That's how much mercy you're going to get in whatever situation. Right? Um, and David got mercy, but he went through some tragedies behind doing that to his friend. As, But again, it goes back to what Ron said as we climaxed um, bringing this home. It goes back to what Ron said. How we love God has to be tied into our loyalty for God. Can't have a separate, can't be, I love God, but you're not loyal to God. You're not loyal to what? The furtherance of the gospel. You're not loyal to your ministry. You're not loyal to, you know, making sure the word of God reigns in your home with your children over your life. You know, you're not loyal to God when it comes when you're around your friends and you, you know, the people that don't know the Lord. Your loyalty is on the back burner in a lot of situations. Mm -hmm. It always has to be in the forefront. And that's all we're trying to say in the nut today. Amen. Okay, Ron, back to you. Amen. Uh, I'm sorry, Minister Mike. Awesome points, Bishop. Hey, praise the Lord, everybody. I love I love what you guys are saying. I mean, talking about God's love, we can talk about God's love forever. Um, I know Amen. we have to wrap up soon, but you know, David. He had, he dealt with some dire consequences because of what he did. And those consequences were very, very serious. You know, lost his son, a lot happened. You know what I like though about David is that he never got angry for God, or he never got angry with God, I'd rather say, mm -hmm. because of his consequences. See, there's consequences that we fall under because of the things that we do and what happens is we want God to just remove all the consequences and things of that nature. He gives us grace, but we feel it every day. Mm. And when he lost his first son, wow. and the consequences of that, he agreed with God. He agreed with God. He said, okay, Lord, he got himself up. The, the scripture said that brother, um, Minister Ron read, he cleaned himself up and they say he went and worshiped God after that baby died, that first baby that he had with Bathsheba died. And I think that's one of the most powerful acts of his mindset. He agreed with God. He never was angry at God. He understood the consequences and he trusted God. And that same womb that that baby died is the womb that Solomon came through. 
See, God wants us to trust him even when he's dealing with us. Even when everything's going wrong and we don't like nothing that's going on in our lives. I still love you, Lord. Though you slay me, yet I'll trust you. Though right now things are looking very bleak for me, I don't understand what's happening, I'm going to trust you. And them, them moments right there is when them breakthroughs take place for us. A lot of us don't agree with God in the areas we are in our life. We're upset at the lot, with a lot of like, the lot that we have in life and what God has us. And God wants you to agree with him and trust him even when everything else is going wrong. And I know I'm saying this so easy. It's hard to do that. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to do. I, mean, I know I'm saying it. It sounds so smooth how I'm saying it. But to trust God when everything's going wrong and God is not doing nothing you like, it's not easy to do. But as you begin to serve God in spirit and in truth and you have the right mindset towards God, you'll be able to serve God no matter what you're going, to be, you're going to be able to agree with God no matter what you know and even at times in my life when I'm like man I don't like nothing that's going on Lord I don't know what's happening but I know you're still God and I have to trust you I, got, I cannot go no other way I can't lean on my own understanding another thing I like that you said Minister Ron is talking about how you know God's love you know is tied to loyalty and you and Minister Ron is saying but you know I like what he's like what Jesus said to Peter he said, you love me? He asked Peter that three times. We know that if you ever read that text, it's powerful. Mm. And he's very, the very next line, he said, feed my sheep. See, love has to do with feeding the sheep. You know, we can't say we love God and we ain't got nothing going on for the Lord. You know, mm. Mm. you know, it's like, it's like us, how we are as people. If someone say they love you, but you never see it or it's never displayed. You know, then it's just words. It's like Brother Cal said, lip service, you know, mm. but you have to feed the sheep. We should all have our personal ministries and we should all be looking for opportunities to feed the sheep, you know? And it's just like understanding that that is a mindset we must have. And another thing too, it's very important that we understand doctrine. There's no love apart from truth. I always say this, we say this in this ministry a lot. You can't love somebody if you're lying to them. Mm. The truth will set you free. There's no such thing as I love you, but I'm constantly lying to you. You know, that don't go together. Love is truth. And one thing about Jesus Christ, he is the truth. He is the truth. And we have to make sure that we in truth. That's why we have these fellowships and things like that, because we want people to know the truth of Jesus Christ. You have to have it. That's why it's so important. And, um, and finally, I just want to say that, you know, the love of God is, like I said before, it's, you can't comprehend the love of God. You know, the love of God just knocked me off my feet when I gave my heart to him. Like even every day, his love, that's one constant for us that save on this cause Christians that we should feel his is his love. The same power of God's love that I felt when I first got saved, I still feel it to this day. His Amen. love is unbelievable. It never fails, you know? And I think Brother Cal said it best, God is love, you know? We love, but he is love. And it's profound to me that the same love I felt when I first got saved is the same love I feel today after being saved about 15 so more years now. But mm -hmm. that love is that still volume of it, the power of it, the realness of his love is still prevalent. And I just want to encourage people that his love never fails. That same love that saved you is the same love that operates today. He loves you. He knows the very hairs on your head are numbered by him. There's strings of strands of hair on your head. No one can love you the way he love, loves you. Mm -hmm. Just got to turn to him and trust him. He's right there. He's saying, listen, I don't know if you're putting your trust in everything else. Just turn to me. I'm here. But what happens with us is that we, we lean on our own understanding. We want to trust everything else besides his direction. And sometimes God's going to blindfold us. And we have to trust him without seeing and be led by the hand. And those times that God does that in our lives, I know I'm not talking to myself because we all been there. If you haven't, we have to just trust God. and You can't see what's in front of you. Those times build character. It builds that friendship that Brother Cal talked about. We can't build that friendship if we don't exercise our faith and put our faith into action. Yeah, your gospel, everything you know about Christ, it should, it should roll out into your natural lives. You know, it should be impacting your everyday life. The gospel should impact your everyday life. Mm -hmm. It should just be like, okay, God is good, but it's no impact on your everyday life. The gospel has affected my everyday life. I think, I think different. I'm still a sinner saved by grace. I'm not nothing but a, you know, just a man, for, a man of like passions, like everybody else on this call. But my mindset and what I feel is different day by day. His, the gospel has rolled into my natural life. It's impacted my everyday life. And what happens with us is you try to keep the gospel from our everyday lives, but it has to go into our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Once the gospel goes into those places that we keep God from, God's going to do some miraculous things in your life. Let him in, let him in them empty spaces, them places that he ain't in, in your heart. 
Let him get to them corners, and you'll be surprised and amazed what God can do. He'll blow your mind. So I wanted to say, brother, good word today. Amen, 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 and more amen. And as we close out, uh, and I think we got to, you guys probably know what the next few slides are coming uh, as we shut it down. Abraham and David remain to me as the pinnacle, right? As the greatest show that I can say in, 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 in human form that shows us the way we should love a holy, righteous God. However, there was one who took it to another level. And we already know who it is. You know, the amazing thing about everything God does is God never asked of us anything that he wasn't able to do himself. Isn't it so powerful that in those instances, God comes down and says, you know what? Abraham, you know what? Don't worry about Isaac. I'm going to send Isaac in the form of me and Jesus Christ. He's going to come down and he's going to do you. Wait, they, you know, it's, it's so funny. Jesus Christ shows the ultimate in love. Now, no disrespect, but Abraham was about to come down on, you know, Isaac. And no disrespect, but God called uh, uh, Bathsheba and his son home. But he was still living. The Shiva was still living. He allowed them to live. And this is what uh, Minister Cal was saying earlier. He, he, he let them go through the punishment, but he brought them up. Not only did he allow them to live, he gave them another son. And this son was, was the greatest of them all, right? The, the Solomon's wisdom is renowned. So he superseded anything that David could have predicted in a son. Right. And then, of course, he gives Abraham what he asked for every nation of the earth. Right. But then in closing, God says this for no love is greater than for one to lay one's life down. Here's that key word for his friend to lay one's life down for his friend. And Jesus Christ comes and fulfills this. And not only. Do we know that when we talk now, we speak from the perspective of the Holy Spirit, different than what uh, our beloved uh, uh, matriarchs. But the point is, is that we have give, been given every example of what we need to see when we have to operate. And I like what, what Brother Mike said. It's not easy. We get it. It isn't. We'll sit here and, and we'll get off of this Bible study in a couple of minutes and we're amening and we're feeling really good. And then on Tuesday afternoon, we get a kick in the stomach with something that's going to challenge this very scripture. It's going to challenge this. You'll get a call from somewhere or someone. So we all get it. We've been around the block for a while. We know how this thing works. But the point is what I love about today is what we want to do is we want to continue to encourage that we can trust a God. And I like something that... Minister Cal said, he said, a lot of people went into buildings and planes and committed hideous acts and do not have this type of relationship with their God, but they're running around and they're doing it anyway. I was listening to a, a guy I used to like a lot uh, named Terrence Howard, and I was trying to find out what happened to him. How did he fall from, the, from, from his faith? Because he started out in the Christian walk, and he was talking about some, some hideous act that happened with a Muslim who ended up cutting and castrating somebody who urinated on the temple. And he was just like, I was so disgusted after that, you know? And so uh, we don't have those stories. We don't have those excuses, right? The God that we loved and served absolutely showed us how it's done by laying his own life down, God taking his own son and using that as the, the pinnacle to show us all how we are to love him the way he wants to be loved. And again, like we said, what kind of loyalty is this? We all know that Jesus could have walked away. Satan made that clear in the temptation in the book of Matthew. You, you could jump off this mountain and then the angels will catch you before you one heel hits the ground. So when you see this, really guys, what excuses do we have? That's all I got today, guys. I hope you were blessed by this. Sorry we went over the time, uh, but no, it was powerful. Any closing remarks before we close out, guys? I know we ran a little over time today, but the floor is open if you want to share your thoughts on today's Bible study. Hi, I just wanted to make a comment because I 
being younger, I try to look at what everyone around me is thinking and try to relate the gospel to that. So I remember there was a time when one of my guy friends, he was distraught because a girl broke his heart. It was a tragedy. And I remember one of the key things he said was, oh, I don't know about love anymore. I want loyalty. And of course, me being the person I am, I looked at him like he had 10 heads. I said, what are you talking about? He, I was like, what do you mean by that? He was like, well, I just want loyalty because love just hurts you. So just give me the loyalty. And then I was like, well, you know, the reason why I show loyalty to you is because I love you. Mm. And then that stopped him. He was like, oh, that's deep. And I was just like, oh, this, this boy is in trouble. But what it helped me realize oh. that there are people who in this day and age do not even know what the definition of love is and don't know how to love properly. And because they don't know that, they go about it in their own way. And this Bible study just helped me remember that there are some people who legitimately think they know what love is and they don't because they separate the key components that are found only in love. Amen. And that's what I have to say. Amen, sister. Thank you for that. Thanks for sharing. Amen. Amen.